You know, from my standpoint, all of you are all the experts, so really the only thing that I can, can talk to is, uh, is just essentially, you know, what we hear from, you know, the state and local government DMOs that I work with, uh, that being Massachusetts, City of Boston, um, either directly or indirectly, um, you know, New York uh, City and the state level of New York as well. So um, that's certainly, uh, you know, something that I want to pass on is just what we hear from them and, and really what the, the lay of the land is. Um, afterwards, we'll have a day uh, fireside chat with Destination BC uh, from my home province of British Columbia. So uh, always great to have them here, the Pacific Northwest of North America, of course. Um, anyway, what I wanted to, to talk about um, is certainly just, I think, the digital world that many of you would be familiar with, which um, at one point in time, this was probably what you were used to. Uh, for you know, the city of New York, which um, we'll get into a little bit in terms of specifically what they're doing for crowdsourcing content, this was their reality up until about the past year or so, where they were used to their customers, um, visitors, coming to them. And that was either through email, predominantly through the website, um, and really that was what the content was that was out there was mainly coming from New York, putting it out there for visitors that were actively seeking information all the time. Of course, New York being a, a coveted destination, they were getting a lot of walk-up traffic. But where the world has sort of changed, and I think many of us probably are realizing this or seeing this, or many of you, uh, is that now the majority of the content that's out there is actually from your visitors. And I think that's no surprise to anybody, of course, where it's now incumbent upon the DMO to try and figure out what do we do with that content that holds a lot of power to it, where you've got people sharing through pics and videos, and um, it really doesn't even matter what the social network is per se, because they'll constantly change and evolve. It's the fact is that what's out there in the digital world is content that's being created by your visitors, so how do you harness that to create the power? Where it's less about, you know, the website plays less of a role in, in how you're connecting um, with those that you want to market to and those visitors that are coming there. So it's actively going out there and seeking and finding that content. So what the city of New York did, um, and we'll talk about with, with our destination British Columbia as well, pardon me, um, in the fireside chat, is really found out new ways to harness that content and share their stories in terms of how they harness that information and use that to um, promote and, and ultimately attract visitors. So with New York, I mean, what they did was they wanted to, they started with a simple objective. It was essentially, everybody knows the city of New York, obviously, for the Empire State Building and Statue of Liberty and numerous other you know, sort of mainstay tourist attractions. But for the city of New York, they started with the standpoint that, how do we share the story of New York that New Yorkers know? And that was where they encouraged. And first off, realized that, okay, there's been a shift. And this was only something that happened over the past year, really. There's been a shift in the kind of content that's out there. It's no longer us pushing it out. We want to go and collect it, and we want to figure out the best way to collect it and best way to utilize it. So they started off with the objective of how do we share the New York that New Yorkers know, and then they went out there and they targeted by different SKUs or categories or niches in terms of you know, fashion, dining, um, you know, even regionally throughout the city. They wanted you know, people to understand what you know, the cool restaurant in Williamsburg was, or the Henry Hudson Bridge, these sorts of elements of New York that the average visitor is completely unaware of. So by targeting uh, specific influencers and um, you know, people, bloggers, others that were driving active content within those categories that they chose, they went out there and targeted them and incentivized them, pardon me, with the idea that, well, we can probably help you out in terms of um, giving you backstage access. Um, you know, if you've got a blog, we'll give you backstage access to you know, Madison Square Garden uh, at some point in time, Empire State Building. They incentivized them with rewards that were relatively cost effective because they had access to it, um, but was something that obviously attracted to bloggers because it allowed them to create more content. So in doing so, they had a stable base and a network, a community of people that were now actively sharing content that could be repurposed by NYC and company, which is the DMO for the city of New York, um, and getting them out there and, uh, and sharing that content, driving your city, which now started to create a whole new New York for those that were visiting there. Um, Destination British Columbia, who we'll bring up here very shortly. Um, many of you may be familiar with the story that Leah Poulton um, had shared last year from Destination British Columbia. Uh, so we'll certainly talk about 
um, over the past year what's happened with that. But ultimately, you know, their key objectives in terms of uh, targeting individuals and having individual conversations and what that meant as far as driving meaningful relationships and looking at that and building on that. And really how uh, over the past year, social has become you know, a core part um, in addition to all the other services that they you know, um, provide or other marketing attempts that they have. Um, social is a core part of that and then supported by other traditional means in terms of traditional advertising and such. And really look at you know, what the um, relationship means that they've developed with uh, individuals and how they've managed to spread that on mass. So um, I'd like to bring up, uh, if we can, maybe organize a couple of chairs, uh, Leah Poulton and Julia Crawford from Destination British Columbia, which is the DMO for the province of BC. Oh, I should mention, as they make their way up here, these owls, you're strongly encouraged to tweet as much as possible. Um, and if anybody asks any questions, be more than happy to, to pass these out. Thank you both for joining. Um, so maybe we could just start with, I guess, uh, I kind of got into it a little bit there, but sharing you know, where things are at right now with Destination British Columbia, um, where you've been, and, and I guess where your vision is for the future. All right. Um, well, I guess in terms of where we've been, um, yeah, we've definitely come a long way in the last three or four years. Um, you know, we started out like everybody else with a Twitter and Facebook channel and just kind of posting links to our website and posting trip planning advice and posting, you know, supporting campaign content, um, really just using social as a kind of a supporting marketing tool. Um, you know, as we did that and we really focused on, um, you know, communicating back to people, we noticed that a lot of people were really interested in talking to us about, um, about BC. And a lot of people were talking about it, not to us at all, but just talking about it. Um, so we started testing out some projects that were really focused on um, two-way communication um, and getting, and you know, creating content based on what people were talking about. Um, in 2012, we did a, a blogger tour that was fan-powered. So we basically, um, got our Facebook fans to tell us where we should send these, this group of bloggers that we had in the province. This was pretty you know, out there for us at the time, and uh, there's a little bit of panic with risk management teams and other things, but um, it, and it turned out really well, and it kind of really jump-started our, our Facebook community and um, set the foundation for our whole approach to social, which again is really focused on um, building that community based on you know, mm -hmm. individual conversations. Um, you know, moving forward from there, we tested out a couple of projects, um, the one you know, we talked about last year, um, which are really focused on, uh, again, conversation mm -hmm. um, with, you know, social at the core in that they, the, the KPIs for the, the campaigns or the projects were conversation based. So it wasn't how many people saw our content, it was how many people, you know, did we get talking about BC? Um, and again, really focusing on the, the way we got that volume is by one-to-one -one conversation. So again, not, not just paying to get content out there, but um, doing kind of the, the, you know, the legwork to get, to get people talking. Um, you know, in the last year, we've really um, come a long way in terms of, um, we're almost at the point where social is really touching almost every thing our organization does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even some areas that are traditionally um, very offline focused. So stuff like des destination development, um, where traditionally, you know, it's more focused on, um, you know, things like, you know, do you have the proper signage up? Are you, um, do you have customer service training for your staff? Um, and we've really transitioned towards, uh, you know, the core question is, are you creating shareable experiences? So that's a, kind of a big shift too. Um, and then all the, you know, the training that comes along with that. Um, and then visitor servicing as well. So, you know, traditionally visitor servicing and marketing are, are uh, you know, separate, um, but they've kind of become so intertwined that because the customer journey is, they're checking in on social all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't really separate, you know, the person from when you're trying to get them to come to when they're actually here. It's really part of one big cycle, so it, you kind of have to integrate those two disciplines, and that's kind of 
where we've gone. Um, yeah, one of our big corporate objectives is creating um, uh, a, a powerful marketing um, network for the province. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about us. Again, it's about how can we empower our partners? How can we get all of us aligned? And so we're all really um, effectively, you know, touching in with the visitor at all of these different points. So it's not just about marketing anymore. It's, it's really, you know, like, um, like was mentioned yesterday, it's, it's about social business now. It's, it's touching every, almost everything that we do. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that you know, as our strategy has evolved, so have our roles. Um, I think our team right now acts a little bit like an internal agency that sort of supports all other aspects of our organization, you know, some more traditional kind of offline areas like in um, destination development. And, you know, for us, social is no longer a separate strategy, but it's, you know, as Leah mentioned, really creating this sort of seamless experience for the visitor that's both offline and online. Hmm, okay. How is, uh, I guess, social evolved during that process? Um, well, I think in terms of like social, how it's evolved to kind of meet the needs of the consumer, we're definitely moving away from being content creators into really just being social listener and distributors. So we're not only just using social listening to find and engage with these visitors online, but we're really um, you know, creating content based on the needs of that consumer. Um, one example of this that we've done is we've had five of our largest visitor centers around the province um, who at one time were doing their own social media marketing and we realized that just didn't make any sense as a model for us. So what we wanted to do was still to use their kind of local BC knowledge and we got them to submit their top most you know, five asked questions at the visitor center that month and we had them create a blog post for us based on that question. So if you can imagine, you know, for every one person that walks into a visitor center that has a question about, you know, the top attractions to do in that location or where the best places are to bird watch, you know, there's probably 20 more people who are actually Googling that same question. Um, you know, and as Leah kind of alluded to earlier, you know, one of our core Facebook strategies has always been to really kind of tap, tap into our very local and passionate and engaged community. So we um, wanted to crowdsource information based on these, you know, BC advocates. And we ask our community almost every week or almost every month, you know, different questions about, you know, maybe where the top photography spots are in Vancouver and it's a whole range of themes, but essentially we're crowdsourcing this information and then we can create a blog post based on that that we then push back on all of our channels and we can target to some of our you know, visitors in our key markets. So just about kind of this local authentic perspective. It's not us as Destination BC telling them what they should do, but rather our you know, BC residents and our fans and our advocates. And we've got some, I guess, some of the numbers there in terms of um, success that you've seen since the start of social and that sort of thing. And it sounds like what you're describing, I mean, you're creating a network of people that are out there. It's not just visitors or customers. It's a network of, of a community that you have that's out there as well. I mean, have you had specific challenges? Um, or I guess what are some of the specific challenges that you've had in creating that network? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, these, these stats are just from our Twitter channel, which is one um, uh, channel we had a very you know, clear strate strategic shift on, especially after the learnings from last summer's campaign. Um, and you can see kind of in the top where we started focusing on one-to-one um, -one outreach. So the volume of tweets went up significantly, but so did the engagement. Um, and again, these aren't necessarily all people retweeting our content. It's more one-to-one um, -one engagements. Um, and you can see from you know, the stats at the bottom, we send a lot of tweets. A lot of them, again, are their one-to-one -one conversation, but we also engage um, uh, a lot of unique people, which is really, yeah, I think we're, that's kind of indicative of the shift for us is we're moving away from some of the traditional social marketing KPIs and looking more at how many unique people are we talking to? How many people are talking about BC in general, um, not just to us? It's not about how many followers we have. Um, so I think, yeah, we're looking to, are we creating advocates? Are we, you know, enhancing someone's on the ground experience? And I mean, obviously one of the challenges around that is if you have someone sending that many tweets, it's, it's fairly time intensive. Um, but I mean, what we did is we didn't, you know, hire an army of people. We're not, you know, we're not quite KLM, but uh, we uh, hired, you know, Somebody, a contractor to support us on, on the weekends and outside of office hours because we realized you know, visitors aren't nine to five. We're actually seeing you know, Saturday mornings might be our, 
the top time that people are talk asking what to do or just talking about being somewhere in our, in our destination. So um, yeah, so you don't necessarily need to hire an army of full-time people. Um, you know, you can really focus in your efforts where they're gonna have the most impact. Um, yeah, I mean, other challenges, we, we have the same challenges as a lot of pe other people in this room. I mean, budget, you know, resources, politics, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, we're all, you know, and you know, working with our partners, um, we're all kind of in the same boat and we all really are working towards the same objective. Um, yeah, so I think, I think really showing the value of um, some of these um, projects that we do and some of these small shifts that we make um, and tying them back to corporate objectives makes it um, a lot easier to get kind of buy-in and, and push it forward. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we're um, kind of based on this ship that we did over the winter, we decided to run this pilot project that we're currently doing right now. Um, and the concept is, again, taking this kind of, you know, network and moving it kind of into us also building that out into a social space. So, um, you know, BC is a very large province. We have about, I think, 112 visitor centers, you know, in every corner. Um, and what we wanted to do was to take about eight of these visitor centers and empower them using Hootsuite and, you know, to take the same skills that they have offline, you know, in the visitor center, same level of customer service, the same type of BC knowledge. Um, and we wanted to have them actively look for and engage with visitors in social media. So, you know, the idea here is that we're not necessarily, um, or what we're doing is we're f looking for and engaging with visitors, you know, on the channel of their choice. And that could be, you know, maybe the visitor center, like an actual brick and bricks, brick and mortar location that they go into, or it could be on Twitter, or it could be on, you know, um, TripAdvisor. You know, traditionally the visitor centers and the visitor center staff have always been kind of that frontline connection for us to, you know, the traveler and to the visitor, or sorry, um, to the traveler and visitor. And, you know, who better to, you know, be looking for these people um, and talking to, you know, these, um, you know, visitors online and social media than them. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I've got some of the other, I just kind of, you know, overviews of, of what you're, you're doing up here. Um, just for, I think, obviously, kind of helping to tell that story. But in terms of, I guess, looking at ROI was something that was talked about all the time, I think, when people first started off in, in social media. And was, I think really more than anything else to justify it. There was someone on the executive level that was, we've all probably heard it or everybody's heard it. I don't get it. Um, why do you do it? Like, what's, you know, what's the point in putting the effort in? What do you, how do you get executive buy-in now? Do you use ROI or what sort of ROI, I don't know, do you look at? Um, yeah, still, still get asked that all the time. Um, I don't think that question's going anywhere, we all know. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think the, um, like I said, one of the, the best ways to show the value is to try and you know, tie your efforts back to corporate goals. So you know, talk to your CEO, talk to, talk to your industry. Is there, is there a specific challenge in your industry that social can help address? Because if you can, even if it's just a pilot project or you know, a, a, a small campaign that addresses that, that issue or that challenge um, or that corporate, corporate goal, it's a lot easier to demonstrate the value of what we do um, as opposed to just saying, well, you know, we gained 100 followers this month. Well, what does that mean for the organization? What does that mean for tourism in our destination? Um, so I think like, think big to start um, uh, and really try to, you know, support your organization, your industry's goals. Um, and then I, I think constantly demonstrate value. I mean, look for opportunities to, um, you know, for people who do social media every day, you know, we see, we see comments all the time that are like, you know, almost a, a literal example of somebody like, wow, look at that person moving from inspiration to active consideration. Screenshot that, save it with, or share it with someone. Like, screenshot everything, because <laughs> you'll, you'll be asked um, to show kind of the value of what you do, and then you have those contextual examples, because, yeah, again, the, a list of numbers doesn't really necessarily um, drive home the impact of, of everything that we do. Um, so I think those contextual um, examples are really, really important because like for us, we see them every day, but 
um, chances are, you know, someone on your executive or um, even someone in your industry who um, might be doing the same thing, but they're not watching your channels, just to, to demonstrate the value to them of, like, look what we're doing, like, these are, these are real people in our destination or coming to our destination. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's hugely helpful. Um, and then I think, you know, for us, we're a, you know, province or, or state level organization. So, um, you know, anytime we can work with our industry partners and help demonstrate the value of what we do to them, um, you know, then we, you know, have their buy-in as well. And that always will kind of come back to um, our organization and it, you know, just moves all of us forward. Mm. In terms of, um, I guess internally, anything to add, Julie? No. Nope. Uh, in terms of, I guess internally, um, you know, obviously staff is traditionally used to the main channels of communication with with visitors, um, and there's a shift now to social media. I mean, what I guess are the specific challenges that you've had? Because it sounds like the vision is for um, there to be that network internally of of touch points for Destination BC for any visitor that's coming to British Columbia, you know, the journey can begin, you know, maybe where they're located. And then when they come to BC, they're reaching out to specific regions and that sort of thing. As far as equipping staff to have that mindset of, you know, incorporating social into that more and more, um, or allowing social to fulfill that. I mean, what are some of the specific challenges that you've had with that? Um, well, I mean, like I said, it's, you know, it's a lot of the traditional ones around, you know, resourcing and um, I think you know, Julie has found, especially through this pilot project, um, a lot of, you know, in the, the visitor centers, sometimes they're, they're just, they're too busy with people in the location to, to even be online. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But mm -hmm. um, it's also, you know, maybe we need to think about working with them um, further in advance to even staff specifically for this. Like, it's kind of, it's shifts like that, and it's um, prioritization changes within, um, again, our organization and the industry in our destination. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're always gonna have those, those challenges. That's just the nature of, of what we do um, and the way our organizations are you know, funded and run. But um, yeah, I don't, maybe you can speak to some of the pilot yeah, so I think specifically within this pilot, like I mentioned earlier, we have about eight different visitor centers of varying sizes and locations around the province. Um, and I think it was alluded to or mentioned yesterday, and it's very true in our case that there's, you know, the one size fits all model just doesn't work. Um, pretty quickly on, we realized that each different visitor center in each different location was so uniquely different, and we really needed to cater to that. Um, you know, as Leah mentioned, this was evident everything from you know resources and time so there's a high turnover of staff for visitor centers um, a lot of them have varying levels of social media experience um, and just the resourcing you know available you know if the visitor center gets busy you know they don't often have time to jump on online to be on the channels um, and the same can be said for us as well too you know is we really want them to buy in and be really engaged with this pilot and kind of our vision for this network we need to be available to have the time and support you know to offer up to them um, you know, everything, you know, um, there was the volume of conversations even, you know, varied drastically. So we have, as one of the pilot um, participants, a small kind of northern community along the Alaska Highway to Vancouver, which is largely considered the gateway to the province. So in Vancouver's case, you know, their problem is just managing and filtering the flow of conversations is just almost too much. And, you know, with some of the smaller pilot participants, we're really focusing on them being the kind of you know, regional rep or almost a spokesperson for their, um, their whole kind of entire area. It's not just about them talking about their one location or, or destination, but it's them, you know, welcoming visitors to the area and to BC in general. Um, another kind of challenge that we saw within the pilot was also just the kind of team buy-in. So traditionally, the social media has always, you know, been or owned by the marketing teams. And what we were asking of these pilot group is to have the visitor centers be a part of those channels and to be, you know, um, a part of that team. So we really wanted to get buy-in from both the marketing and the visitor center teams and have everyone be involved in the process from day one. And as far as, I guess, um, you know, having such diverse staff, you know, throughout the province. How does that work with training, I guess, with, you know, each one's gonna be a little bit different, I would suspect. How does training, how does that, I don't know, how is that fulfilled? Yeah, I mean, again, in the pilot project, um, you know, we started out with doing kind of an initial kind of group training session, and we, we saw a, 
lower engagement than we had um, hoped for. And so we kind of realized we needed to move to a one-on-one, -on -one, individualized, very customized approach. And again, this goes back to, you know, the one size fits all model just really doesn't work. Um, you know, the searches were different, the questions were different, you know, the staff who were, you know, working in the pilot had, you know, varying levels of experience. So we just kind of wanted to take this very customized, you know, individualized approach. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, we really want everybody involved in the pilot to be engaged. So, um, you know, the training just didn't stop there. We do ongoing weekly check-in calls, which are everything from 10 to 20 minutes. And it's just, you know, um, an opportunity for the teams to provide any feedback or insights for us to solve any real-time challenges and to kind of um, keep that sense of accountability for everybody in the pilot and also the level of enthusiasm engagement up. Um, and we also did kind of weekly uh, check-in emails as well too, which I think we have a slide that will show um, one of them coming up here. Uh, and what it is, it's just an opportunity for us to kind of um, send out kind of a, a group email to, the, you know, the larger teams to kind of, again, foster that sense of accountability and enthusiasm. And, you know, we provide kudos. We'll, you know, give a couple shout outs to a couple different teams who had great conversations that week. And um, we'll offer up any tips that we saw based on, you know, any issues or challenges throughout that week. Um, and we also kind of created a welcome kit, which is like a formalized approach, I guess, to the pilot, and it had a daily checklist, and it had a workflow that they can go through, a best practices guide for visitor servicing, um, and had a map of all the different pilot participants. And this here are these visitor cards that we created, and what these are are just actual kind of business cards that the visitor center counselors who are doing the outreach can hand to visitors when they come into the actual centers. And you know we wanted to kind of create that sense of ownership in the pilot and also that sense of pride. So um, you know you can see here that anybody who hands the card out can actually have an opportunity to sign their name and be that person who you know is online as well. Um, yeah, I think just in general. Again, because we're a province level organization, um, and we're, we're, we're lucky that a lot, a lot of our partners already are fairly social media savvy, so we're not necessarily coming in and you know teaching people how to tweet. It's more taking on this role of facilitating this network. So we might be providing access to enterprise level tools. It might be um, providing a, you know a forum for our different partners to connect around social media. Um, this pilot project's a good example of, of us kind of taking that more, like, we're definitely training um, people, but it's more, um, like, it's, yeah, it's more of a facilitator role, and mm -hmm. we're kind of, um, yeah, taking a leadership role in creating this network, I guess, is, is the, real, the real goal. Yeah. Is there a lot of learning from one another in that sort of process? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, we're, we're, the more we work directly with um, you know, the staff on the ground and our partners, we, the more we learn about kind of the visitor and how they operate and it makes us a better partner for them. So I think it's, yeah, it's definitely both ways. It's a lot of insight. Okay. And on the topic of learning, I guess, what would you say are some of the, um, you know, the big moments that you've learned? You obviously started this um, pilot project, you know, last summer, you know, you talked about over the past year and I guess maybe with the evolution of social overall in the organization, I guess, what are some of the things that you'd pass on in terms of what you've learned from the experience? Um, yeah, I would just say based on, you know, my experience within this pilot is like, don't be afraid to run these, you know, pilots or, you know, small projects. I think um, our industry partners and our tourism operators are much more willing to try new things as long as we present them with an opportunity and it goes vice versa as well. You know, if you have an opportunity or an initiative or, you know, project that you want to do, take it to your provincial or your state level, you know, DMR, CBB, um, we're always looking to kind of do that. And I think working collaboratively with those teams is just a, such a good opportunity to get any feedback and insights, and it helps us um, do our jobs better. Yeah, and I think it, I mean, once you start testing some of this stuff out, you can really see the, you know, the potential behind, um, you know, rather than all of us trying to talk to every visitor, there's really this, there's huge potential just to have this kind of seamless experience where we're, you know, handing off messages to each other and we're supporting each other and we're saying, hey, you know what, our friends down the street here are actually the experts in that, so we're going to hand you over to them. And um, from the visitor's point of view, I think it really kind of ups the game for everybody. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're, we're hoping for. Um, yeah, I don't know what, one of my big takeaways over the last... Um, year or so is again really just look for opportunities to have social um, 
you know, help help solve an issue or or align back to a corporate goal. I think that's been that's been huge for us. You know, if your corporate goal is to increase referrals to industry, then think about how social can help support that. Um, look for ways to, you know, test out new things. Um, but not again. Just think think outside the box. So it's not. It's just so beyond marketing now. Um, it's almost like if you do all of this other stuff properly, the marketing will just happen for you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my takeaway. And it sounds like. Would you say? I guess in terms of some of the more um, heavier destinations, like uh, Metro Vancouver, obviously the largest city in British Columbia, um, that opportunity for other regions, like you know, if it's picking up the ball and somebody else running with it gives an opportunity for those other regions that may not be as busy or at busy at points in time throughout the year, an opportunity to take pride, I guess, in the overall brand. Is that something that, that you're starting to see then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's a, that's a huge goal of this, of this pilot is to really create this sense of, you know, you're not just a representative of your community, you're a representative of the province. We all are. And we're, you know, don't be afraid to jump in and welcome someone um, who lands in Vancouver. I mean, that, how cool is that for the visitor, right? Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, look at, like, just, it's really thinking, you know, for visitor centers, thinking outside the brick and mortar walls, thinking outside your community walls, like, just really um, expanding kind of the, uh, yeah, I guess expanding, thinking big, I think, is really the, um, the goal. And I think, yeah, we're definitely seeing that start to happen. Um, I mean, there's one visitor center in particular I'm thinking of that, uh, they actually, um, you know, for them, their their visitor, uh, their visitation to their bricks and mortar location was was down significantly. So they actually made the decision to to close it, and they now have a mobile visitor center, and they set up in coffee shops around the community, mm -hmm. and they have someone who does nothing but social outreach, um, and like that's that's hugely innovative, and um, they really kind of own that, and um, they do exactly what you just said. Like they might, they're not just looking for people talking about their community. They might you know, jump in and welcome someone who's just landed at the airport or, yeah, so it's definitely happening. Cool, okay. Um, I think we probably have a little bit of time and we've got a microphone maybe to take some, some questions from the audience if, if there are questions and also an opportunity to earn um, Owly. You must use the hashtag life of Owly if you're taking any pictures of Owly. So you're, you're pre-warned. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there, if there's questions at all, is there a hand over there? Do we have a mic floating around somewhere? Yeah. Oh. I think we're skipping, we're skipping the boxes. We've got, oh, we'll go with one question here and then there, if that works. We'll make it equitable. All right, I was just going to ask, how long do you, how much time do you spend for those individual connections and responding on Twitter and things like that? How much time does that take up? Um, yeah, it well, it depends. It's, I mean, we have a community manager and that's, part of her role. I mean, she does a lot of other things as well, and there's obviously other channels outside of Twitter. Um, like I said, we have a contractor who helps us out outside of um, business hours, so weekends especially. Um, I think for the pilot participants, we asked for two hours a week to start. Um, but I think the goal is, you know, if we can scale out this model, and that's what we're trying to figure out with this pilot, is that everyone will have, will everyone will be able to do less time because we're all going to be working together to kind of meet the needs of the visitor. Um, so I think, yeah, ideally we kind of decentralize and we, you know, hand off the, um, the torch to all of our partners and say, you know, we're all going to commit to 15 hours a week or something. Um, we haven't fully scaled that out yet, but... And I would say in the case of our contractor as well, we had some set hours, but it was flexible. So it was really up to them to decide where the volume of conversation was happening. So if they you know, maybe had I don't know, 10 hours over the course of you know, three or four days, it could be you know, 15 minutes in the morning on Saturday, or it could be you know, an hour or so on Sunday night. So it was really just flexible and it allowed them to optimize and kind of maximize on the conversations when they were happening. Cool. You've earned an hourly, by the way, so I will, I remember where you are. I will come find you. Um, and we've got, maybe we'll try and just work our way around the room then. Do we have a question over there? I promise the mic will get over here. I guarantee you. <laughs> That's the risk we're running here. 
Yeah, did you meet any sort of resistance from your visitor centers um, with using social? Because one of the problems that we have, I work for a county CVB, and we really want to leverage our partners in their social media, but so many of them, they say, I don't have time or I don't know what to do, and no matter how much training we have, like we give them or offer, they just don't want to do it. So did you run into any of that? And if you did, how did you get past it? Yeah, that's definitely a challenge that we're, we had from the outset and that we're having within the pilot group overall. Um, I think like Leah had mentioned earlier, uh, the idea is that if we can scale this out to be a larger model that ideally we would kind of, the onboarding process would be a lot um, longer and we'd maybe be able to identify a person whose sole job um, was doing some part of the social outreach or ideally maybe the visitor centers can change part of the job description for one counselor that includes like you know social media as part of that job description so really kind of making it a priority and formalizing it but um, there's it's certainly a challenge that we're dealing with and um, it's you know we haven't figured out kind of the perfect solution yet I think it's for us, you know, the weekly ongoing calls and the weekly ongoing check-ins really lets us kind of know in real time like what they're kind of struggling with and gives us an opportunity to maybe say, okay, well, maybe you can change your time to this. Or if they start a conversation and they can't actually finish it, then please assign that back to us so we can follow up. So we're, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a very hands-on process and we haven't figured out a perfect solution, but I think the, the idea is that we would, you know, the teams would prioritize that from the outset. Um, if we kind of scale it out to a larger model. Yeah, and I think in, in general with, I mean, this is kind of true for any initiative or any new change that you're trying to initiate. Um, I think go, you know, look for the people who are enthusiastic and lead with them, like do a pilot with them and then show the value mm -hmm. um, working with those people. So, I mean, there's, yeah, not, we have a lot of visitor centers, we have a lot of organizations we work with. There's varying levels of enthusiasm and skill and um, yeah, I mean, we really, you know, for this pilot project, we looked for those, those visitor centers that were keen to participate and um, yeah, and again, we'll, you know, hopefully use the results to um, get buy-in from some of the ones that maybe aren't so keen. Cool. Um, do we have another question? Okay. We've got this one. It, um, it wasn't answered already then, I think. It, it was somewhat answered. I just want to make sure for clarification. Okay, first, reiteration's always yeah, good. First of all, uh, kudos for thinking outside the box um, and being able Thanks. to yeah, really use the province and uh, um, the, uh, I'll jump to the question. Do you have a social media manager that's watching it throughout? Like, how do you determine which VIC is picking? Like, are you using the Hootsuite platform to be able to assign different tweets or? How are you? Yeah, yeah, we're using um, yeah the enter enterprise version of Hootsuite. So we basically have invited these um, organizations into our Hootsuite organization, which allows us all to assign messages between us. Um, it also gives you really interesting um, team analytics. So we can actually see um, you know response times for different teams. We can see volume um, nice. um, volume of responses for different teams. So it allows us to kind of um, manage and have insights from the the back end as well um but yeah that's does that answer your question okay cool um anyone else at all yeah. or is that a wrap Over here. oh i just have a quick question and you might have kind of touched on this but um we keep all of our social media in-house and how you're talking about the contractor you know two hours during the week that's an awesome idea but do you have to sit down with them and kind of show them your voice or is it like who's the contractor you know how do you find these people because our ad agency has talked about taking it over but we really like to keep it in house because we feel that we're the expert on our city and so I'm just curious to who these contractors are and if you have to train them yeah no definitely we're we're definitely on board with with keeping you know that kind of thing in house for sure um, yeah, I mean, we definitely do, there's definitely an onboarding process um, in terms of, you know, tone of voice, brand, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and I think, again, the, the, the idea, the vision behind this whole, this whole pilot and this whole network model is that we won't need contractors at some point because we'll have this whole network of, of BC experts that have worked with us and... Um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of the end goal. But I mean, if if in the short term you're kind of seeing a need for 
for more support. I think that's a that's a good temporary solution. But yeah, definitely don't. I mean, if you can keep it in house, that's that's definitely the the preference. Okay. Cool. All right. I don't have an owly for you, but I will get you some other Hootsuite swag. Um, and if that's it for questions, I just want to thank both of you for sharing the story. I mean, it sounds like you're on an exciting journey. Obviously, it started, you know, sharing that story last year, and that, you know, hopefully that vision. I think it's very obviously bold, and uh, hopefully, if it succeeds, all the best with that. Thank all you. Right.